Here's my guide on what you need to know when buying a used Mazda MX-5 Miata. G'day folks, my name is Brendan, it's fantastic to have you here. So today we're going to have a chat about everything you need to know about buying a Mazda MX-5 Miata. Um, I've got this red NA6 here, which is a perfect example of something we can have a bit of a look over and I'll show you some of the little tidbits and tricks and things you need to uh, keep an eye out for. So first up, I want to talk about bodywork. Now rust is fairly common around the windscreen uh, area, particularly around this lower sort of section where the uh, windscreen meets the window windscreen frame. Um, particularly in Australian cars, that's about the only place you really see rust. Um, overseas, particularly in uh, places where they salt the roads, the lower sills like down here, and this one here in particular, is particularly bad. Uh, in interestingly, it's worse in the, uh, the NBs than it is in these NAs. Um, but that's about the worst of the rust. They can, it can get pretty bad on some of these salted road areas. Here in Australia, not so bad. We're pretty lucky. Uh, while we're here, I should also talk about the uh, the door mirrors. These are known to fail, particularly in these early 1.6s where they've got the manual adjusted mirror. There's a bolt that goes from this bottom section where this floppy sec bit is uh, into the actual main part of the mirror. That bolt can sometimes sort of get old and corroded over time um, and they can eventually get floppy or even fail and the whole mirror will come off. Um, if that does happen, you lift this plastic piece up, there's a couple of Phillips head screws, pull the whole piece out and then the bolt can be replaced. It's a little bit tricky to get to, um, but it's not a, not a disaster. Uh, as we move further down to the back of the car, in the, uh, in the roof and in this channel here is what's called a rain rail. If I open up the door, it's kind of hard to see, but down in this gap around here, all the way around the back of the roof, is a, uh, a rail of plastic which carries water that falls on the roof in and into rain channels down here. If any of that doesn't work, if any of it's uh, failed or corroded or plastic has uh, sort of gone and deteriorated, uh, you can get water in the boot or in the, uh, the rear parcel shelf here. So keep an eye out for any wet patches around here, inside the uh, the back of the car or into the boot. And I'll show you, I'll open the boot up. What you can end up is water comes in through here. You end up with a wet boot floor or water anywhere in here. That's uh, not a good thing. You can also end up with rust in certain areas. While we're at it, there's also some drain holes. Now these are kind of hard to show you. So inside the car, behind this seat belt tower, down here, there's holes and there's a plastic tray that lives under here. And these holes are where your rain rails drain through and they actually come out outside the seal under the, under the uh, just in front of the rear wheels here. Uh, these need to be cleaned and if they're not cleaned, they can often get full of dirt, leaves, and mud and uh, you end up with again leaking water build up things that you don't want in your car so it's a good idea to check if that's wet uh, means that they're not draining properly and you can clean them out now of course the other thing you have to chat about is the roof itself and so uh, these particularly on the older cars you know when you're talking about a, a 1990s car it's getting closer to what's that 30 years old uh, these can start to deteriorate they get dry they get cracked um, they get torn or damaged and um, you really you don't want a crappy roof <laughs> they just suck uh, you really you want to keep an eye out for a good roof and if it is a bad roof uh, account for the cost of replacing it whether it be an ebay roof like this one is where i paid about 300 dollars and replaced it myself or it's a uh, a nice fancy new one you can get some higher priced stuff or perhaps you want to go with a hard top and what are you looking at a thousand dollars for one of those uh, so keep an eye out for the roof you want to make sure that the zip functions well. You want to make sure that the uh, the latches up the front work. Make sure you bring the put the roof up and down a few times. Get a feel for the uh, the mechanisms and make sure they're all moving and working well. Uh, the front latches can uh, start to wear out and they can start to get loose and they need some adjustment. So keep an eye on those. If they're not well adjusted, maybe all you need to do is fix them up and the roof will work well, or they could be worn out and beyond repair.
So with that all said and done, let's have a talk about some of the interior things. And so if you'll come with me, uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the electric windows. And so uh, these are well known for uh, getting a bit slow with time. Uh, there's a few things that can be the cause of that. First of all, the guides inside the window in the, and in the door can start to get sort of dried up and gross and they just need some lubing up. Uh, secondly, it can be the uh, the cables that run the uh, the window up and down that that again may need some lubing and the third thing is the window switch they tend to fail and start to go a bit shit the contacts get sort of cor corroded I guess you'd say um, and sometimes it's just a matter of removing the switch uh, pulling it apart giving it a clean and putting it back together um, it's particularly bad on these earlier ones on the later NBs I haven't seen as many uh, bad window switches um, also with the windows they can start to get clunky if you rattle them and they sort of clunk around. That means the uh, the bushes inside the doors, uh, the window guides, um, start, started to go bad. And they're, they're sort of round, um, I don't know what you'd call them, they're just a round plastic bush. Um, if they've gone, then it's likely that the window is starting to, to, uh, to rattle because of that. Uh, what else? Also with the doors, is if I move the camera, uh, these door cards can start to go a bit poo over time, particularly on, again, the earlier NAs, where it's just a flat panel. It's sort of made of, like, MDF cardboard stuff. It starts to talk, sort of perish and go a bit yellow and gross. Um, and then the vinyl-y stuff that's on the outside can start to perish as well. So keep an eye on those. Sometimes you need to repair them or replace them. There's certainly some pretty impressive uh, custom door cards out there nowadays. People doing some DIY stuff. So, you know, if you're keen, it's certainly something on the cards that you could do yourself. Um, and probably the last thing I'd like to mention is some of the interior cloths. So I'll get out of the camera, camera's way, and I'll bring you inside. Uh, the seats on the earlier NAs are probably a bit more capable. They do have a bad habit of sometimes getting some cracks in them. Um, they do have, they, they do tend to rip occasionally. Oh, there is actually a rip or something there. Um, on the later NBs, they're kind of, I've noticed sort of on the bolsters and things that can wear out a bit faster than usual. Um, but other than that, the interiors hold up fairly well. Uh, it is pretty well known that these top cluster hood things, they crack pretty easily on the NAs and they can be quite expensive and hard to find. So uh, pray you don't have a broken one of those. So with the interior and the body stuff out of the way, let's look at the uh, probably next important thing, which is the engine. So uh, I'll pop the bonnet. And so in this particular case, we're looking at a reasonably standard 1.6. And so obviously the first thing I'd be looking at is your oil level. Pull your dipstick out, give it a wipe, put it back in and have a look at how much oil you've got on there. You really want to have a proper level of oil. If it's, if it's uh, at least sort of halfway up the uh, dipstick marks, then you're happy. If you've got no oil at all, it's probably the biggest killer of an MX-5. And, uh, an owner who doesn't check their oil is probably a person you don't want to buy a car from as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the next probably obvious thing, and again around oil, is leaks. Uh, they commonly leak from the CAS, which is this doodad here. Um, there's an o-ring that lives on that, that often fails. Uh, you've also got your valve cover gasket, which is the gasket that runs around this. Uh, the front and rear main crank seals and the two cam seals, which are behind this cover here. They're all reasonably common oil leak locations. Uh, they're not all that hard to replace, although they can be fiddly and a bit uh, disconcerting for a first timer. Uh, sometimes you'll find on the earlier 1.6s, also in the 1.8s, is uh, noisy lifters or noisy tappets or whatever you want to call them. Um, this is often only noticeable at startup and it isn't a big deal. If it happens a lot and it's really loud, then you might have something else that's a problem. Um, sometimes it's fixed with just a proper good quality oil change. Uh, but not something to be super worried about as long as it goes away after the first few seconds of startup. Um, if you've got any whining belts or noisy belts, uh, it could be an indication of a over tightened timing belt, maybe even a, uh, say, a bearing in your water pump. So keep an eye on that. Um, misfires and things, pretty rare on these cars. If you do have them, 
uh, any any sort of ignition issues, it's likely to be the leads. They do go even for no reason at all. They'll just start to go bad and you'll get misfires. You replace them and all of a sudden your misfire goes away. Um, and I guess the most important thing to mention is, let me see if I can zoom down here, your front crank pulley. Now this is a long nose pulley. It has these slots in here. I can, it's hard to point them out. If you've got eight, you've got a long nose. If you've got four, you've got a short nose. And you want a long nose if you're buying a 1.6. This only affects the 1.6 cars. If you have a 1.8, don't need to worry about it. Uh, my suggestion is just try and avoid a short nose if you can, and second to that, try and avoid a 1.6 if you can. Generally, 1.8s are always better. While we're under the engine bay, keep an eye on the radiator. If it's going brown or there's any cracks in this top plastic piece, replace it. It's about to go. Um, likewise, if you're any of your hoses are starting to go crispy and hard, um, likely to replace them is a good idea. These are silicon ones, about a hundred bucks. It's certainly well worth replacing them even if you just think it might need to be done. Um, while we're here as well, you might as well check your fluid levels on your brake and clutch master cylinders and your radiator overflow. If any of those are not sort of within the marks, then I'd be questioning why the seller's not checked on the most basic of maintenance. And uh, also ask your seller about when they last did their timing belt. It's a really easy thing to forget to ask, but people should be doing it. I don't think I've ever seen a timing belt fail on an MX-5, but if a seller doesn't know when it was changed, you'd be wondering, can they provide some uh, proof of a uh, service around 100,000 or 200,000 kilometers? Um, and that's about it for engine bay. Generally, you just want to check for oil leaks other than all the things I've already mentioned. And I guess the other thing you can consider is after taking the car for a bit of a test drive, just come and have a look and see if there's anything that's overly hot or overly unusual. You know, if you've got something unusual like boiling fluid in your uh, overflow, maybe you've got steam or smoke coming out of somewhere, uh, keep an eye on it. It's probably a problem that you want to avoid. With engine out of the way, let's have a chat about transmission. Um, and so, I guess the first thing I'd like to mention is back in the interior. Under your shifter, you've got two rubber uh, boots. Now, if you've got an unusually hot transmission tunnel or an unusually noisy transmission tunnel, it's likely that the boots in here have failed. Uh, they're very easy to replace and you're looking at about $50 to $100 to replace the two. Um, and doing so will reduce noise and heat that comes through the trans tunnel. While we're here, also check, check your, uh, your gear knob. If it's floppy and it's wobbling around, it's quite possible that some of the bushings inside the gear shifter have, uh, have failed or perished or gone missing for whatever reason. Again, reasonably easy to replace, um, and they're only a few dollars to buy from your Mazda dealer parts store, whatever you want to call it. The other thing to consider with the transmission is uh, any noises you might, you might get from the clutch area. And so, say you uh, lift your foot off the clutch and you suddenly get grinding or clunking or uh, screeching noises, it's quite possible that one of the either spigot or clutch release bearings is gone. Um, although they're reasonably easy to replace themselves and quite cheap, the hard part is of course getting to them because they're behind a gearbox which needs to be removed and you're looking at 500 odd dollars in labour alone. The last thing worth mentioning around clutches is if you've got a spongy pedal you may have a, uh, a failing clutch slave cylinder. Again these are fairly easy to replace and reasonably cheap aftermarket equivalents are quite readily available and easy enough to install. Now final thing to mention with transmissions is if you've got a weird looking shifter with a T kind of handle and it only moves back and forth and doesn't move left to right, it's possibly an automatic. Steer clear of those. The best thing you can do is to completely burn the car. It's like a spider. Just destroy it and run. That's transmission. Let's talk about brakes. Um, thankfully, there's not a lot to talk about with them because, well, they just work for the most part. They don't really fail. They don't really have any bad points. Um, probably the one thing I would like to mention is that sometimes the calipers can get stuck, particularly in the rears. I think I've had more rears stick than fronts on my cars. Um, if that does happen, generally it's just a rebuild and it's not that hard to do. Um, if you're worried about it, send it to your brake specialist or your mechanic, they can do it. And it won't be that expensive.
And the next thing I would like to talk about is your suspension. And you see, suspension, steering, it's all pretty good in an MX-5, and it actually is pretty sturdy. The problem is, they kind of hide bad points. Um, and so a few things you do want to keep an eye on are leaks around your shock absorbers, or even torn or worn bushes, uh, and even torn or worn sway bar end links. Unusual levels of play in the steering, even when the wheels themselves aren't turning. Weird creaks or clunks when going over hard bumps. And the last thing to keep an eye on is the front ball joint boots. They can't really be repaired and uh, if they wear out they start to leak and you get grease everywhere and then the whole thing needs to be replaced. And a final few things to mention. First of all, have a quick look under the rear of the car. Have a look for any leaks around the diff. Um, the seals in those can start to fail occasionally. Uh, have a look in the boot for the battery. Make sure it's an AGM or a absorbed glass matte battery. You don't want a typical lead acid. And the final thing to consider is the cellar. Are they a bit weird, a bit shifty? Are they kind of acting strange? Are they, can they not answer your questions properly? If you're not really trusting them, then just walk away and find another car. Overall, a Mazda MX-5 is a fantastic, reliable, cheap and efficient car. They're super fun to drive, great track cars, and, well, while I would never drive one every day, um, I, I know many people do, and they have great fun with them. Really, they're a bulletproof car, hard to beat. Really, the only thing that kills them is when you don't change the oil or you don't keep it on in the coolant levels. And my final tip for you today is when you go and buy the car, make sure you ask the seller for any extra spare set of keys because it's very possible that they'll just give you the keys that they're used to using every day and they'll forget about the others. Anyway, folks, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this guide helps you out with you buying your MX-5 Miata. If you enjoyed the video, uh, be sure to give it a like. If you're, uh, if you're interested in more of this sort of MX-5 content, don't forget to subscribe down below. If you think I missed anything and maybe you uh, have an idea on something else that people should keep an eye out on, then uh, don't forget to leave a comment so others can see it. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and at beavismotorsport.com. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.